It's not very often I do this, sitting back to the front on a motorbike. Well, it's John McDonald here from ProScot. Um, said I would do a little introduction video. When I say a little introduction video, I'm going to give you a little idea of what I cover on my advanced rider training courses. I have a bronze course, um, which is really aimed at people who have just fairly recently passed the test or maybe coming back to motorcycling again. Um, uh, so it's really just a, a refresher, it's a, it's a five hour course that one and it kind of gives you all the basics that you need to know for cornering and it's a, a fairly basic level but certainly I would say probably be, beyond the level that's taught for the L test. Once you start getting a bit more confident, a bit more comfortable uh, and you've kind of either consolidated the, your learning ability and skill level after passing the L test and you want to get know a bit more or you've maybe been out there for a few years and you feel that your riding's plateaued but you want to take it on to the next level that's when then people start coming and having a look riders start coming to me and seeing about the silver course that i do uh, i also do a gold course as well which is one that really prepares you for um sitting either the iem or the rospa test and all the trainings based around the police um roadcraft manual and the system of riding uh, as well so let's talk quickly about the silver course uh, which is the one that, that um, I think most people once I've got the basics and feel fairly comfortable um, after the bronze would want to go into the silver course so let's tell you what's in the silver course then. The silver course uh, is a two-day course I talk first of all uh, about theory in the morning on the first morning and the theory covers two main areas really road craft and machine control so what do I cover in road craft well, I cover first of all um, the importance of um, lifting, extending, vision and dealing with man-made and natural features. I'm not going to talk too much about what each section is at the moment because I'm going to plan to split them down into shorter videos on each section, otherwise this video will be too long. So, uh, dealing with man-made and natural features first of all, and identifying man-made and nat uh, natural features and building them into your riding plan. The next one then is dealing with the, the road signs and the road markings themselves. What is that information telling you and how would you build that into your riding plan? I'll tell you in a moment what I mean by the riding plan. Uh, once you've dealt with the road signs and the road markings themselves and you've gleaned the information that's available from them, the same as you've gleaned the information from the man-made and natural features, uh, you're then starting to study the road surface more particularly the, the slope, the elevation, the camber, is it uphill, is it downhill, is it positive camber, is it negative camber, what's the surface itself like, um, is it often good levels of grip and adhesion or restricted limited levels of grip and adhesion, um, and helping you to identify that, you know, being able to look at tarmac surface and know that if it's providing you grip or not. Um, for example, on a on a, and again, I'm not going to go into this too deep, but on a, on a dry day, light coloured surfaces are usually a good sign, darker coloured surfaces are not so good. And I'll go more into that on the, when I talk a bit more about road surfaces and how to deal with them. Uh, on a wet day, uh, the opposite, I, I tend to go more for the darker coloured areas rather than the light shiny coloured areas. And again, as I say, I'll go into the reasons behind that. So assessing the surface completely, the integrity of the surface, you know, what, what's it like? Well, there's a change in colour of tarmac, we can be a change in grip level. So we'll break that one down. Uh, so man-made natural features, road signs, road markings, the surface itself, camber, slope, elevation, grip levels that's available, what kind of grip is going to be provided, what tarmac for example provides better grip in the uh, in the dry but maybe not so good in the wet and vice versa the, the tarmac that can offer very high levels of grip in the wet surface. Um, after that we start looking at something called the vanishing point or the limit point, it's just a fancy way of really saying where the offside and near side uh, form a point come together and restrict your forward vision. Um, and it works based on the principle that if your vision is reducing your speed should be reducing um, if your vision's been maintained and it's safe to do so, and in other words you can stop within the distance you can see to be clear, then you maintain your speed. And if your vision's beginning to extend or open up, and that means that the bend's beginning to open up and providing it's safe to do so, you can look to begin to start building up your speed smoothly as you exit from the turn. So the limit point effectively is like a crystal ball. It, it helps you to approach a bend and know when to slow, know when to go. Uh, sorry, know when to slow, know when to maintain and know when to go. I'll go in a bit more detail about that one as well, of course. Um, but basically, the closer you get to a bend, the limit point begins to match 
um, the tighter that bend is and I'll show you how that actually works. Um, so there we go then, we've looked at the man-made, the natural features, um, uh, looking at that as part of your roadcraft, looking at the road signs, the road markings, gleaning information from that, the road surface, the camber, the slope, the elevation and then the limit point and the vanishing point. And all that information that you're feeding in there is going into the system of motorcycle riding. The system of motorcycle riding which the police uh, roadcraft manual is based around, which is the core principle of advanced rider skills. Of course, L-Test riding is built around OSMPSL, cars is MSMPSL, mirror signal manoeuvre, the manoeuvre broken down to position, speed and look. And motorcycles are observation signal manoeuvre and manoeuvre broken down to position, speed and look. Why is observation and not mirrors? Well, because in the good old days the mirrors weren't particularly good in the motorcycle, so you might have had to use a combination of mirror and rearward glances, hence observation as opposed to mirror, observation signal manoeuvre. So that's the, the basic L-Test system, if you like, MSM and OSM. Uh, the advanced is IPSGA, information, position, speed, gear, acceleration. And again, I'm going to go into more detail about IPSGA, um, how you gather information, um, how you get that information in front, um, out to the sides, behind you, how you gather that information uh, and how you build that into your riding plan to determine where you should be positioned, that's the P part, what speed you should be at, um, and then the gear that you should be in, that's you now passing through the hazard, so by the time you pass through the hazard now you've gleaned the information, you've prioritised, set a level of danger, thought about um, your position on approach to reduce risk, adjusted your speed on approach, got yourself in the right gear, um, and this is you now passing through the hazard. Once you've passed through the hazard, now accelerating. So it's a systematic approach, in other words, to forming, um, uh, dealing with all hazards safely. And that goes for all hazards, even bends, parked cars at the side of the road, junctions, crossroads, roundabouts. That's what that's what the system of riding is. So when you're riding along, there's lots of Ipsgas in your head. So we'll teach you how to use Ipsga and how that's built in and how you use that and build it onto your riding plan. And the riding plan is exactly that. Gathering information and deciding where you should be best positioned um, and as I say, I'll go into more detail with this one, but the best position to make yourself visible to others so that others can see you and the best position for safety, which always overrides other two. So there's Ipska and there's Roadcraft. So the first thing is to get your mind thinking on, on Roadcraft. But of course, it's no good um, worrying about Roadcraft if your bike control's not any good. So the next thing I want to do is actually look at the bike control itself. Um, and before I go into the bike control, two things I want to mention as well. One. You need to make sure your bike's properly maintained. Um, no point going out there with your motorbike, having difficulty going in the bends and you've got tyres that are worn down past the wear band, squared off and they're falling, uh, tracking with every groove on the road. Tyre pressure's not right on them. Um, as an ex-racer, myself, I say ex-racer, I was still racing up until last year. Um, if your tyre pressures are out, your bike just doesn't handle right. So get all the basics right first. Get a good mechanic. If you're not competent yourself, get somebody good to check them over. Is your tyres okay? Proper tyre pressures? Suspension set up okay and working okay? Oh, your wheel bearings, etc. And head bearings, chains, sprockets, etc. So the bike needs to be mechanically sound. No worrying about your riding if the bike's not right. And then you, you need to be right as well. I mean, if you're emotionally upset, um, your mind's not in a good place, it might not be the best play time to go out and ride your motorbike. Uh, if you're uh, maybe uh, under medication, then that might affect your focus, your concentration, etc. So you've got to make sure that, that you um, are feeling sharp, alert, ready to be out there. You're not going to be able to observe, glean information, process that information and put in place, place the right riding plan if you're half asleep on the motorbike or your mind is elsewhere. So the bike's got to be right, you've got to be right. So, I've already mentioned the road craft, and as I say, I'll break that down into wee chunks for you. Next thing is the bike control itself, and actually it's not quite as complex as you would maybe think. If you think about it, there's only basic things. We've got a motorbike, we've got a throttle, we've got a front brake, we've got a back brake, we've got a clutch, we've got a gearbox, and we've got a bike that can lean. And basically, it's, it's all about what you do and where you do it. That's what makes the difference. Doing the right thing at the right time, operating the the correct control at the right time in the right way. So, needless to say then, uh, you can imagine I'm going to break that control down. I'm going to break it down, first of all, into sitting on the bike correctly. You need to be able to sit on the bike correctly, what we call correct deportment. Or, or, are you sitting in a relaxed way so that you can um, use, hold the handlebars and be able to steer the bike properly, effectively? Principle called counter steer. 
um, which we'll mention in a moment. I'm going into a bit of detail, uh, as I say, in a moment. Um, being able to put your weight on the foot pegs, be able to adjust your body position if necessary so that you can optimise your stability through the corner as well. So, look at body position, that's important. Once we've got the body and got relaxed on the motorcycle, the next thing to look at is being able to steer the bike. No good being on a motorbike if you can't make that motorcycle go exactly where you want it to go. If there was a 50 pence piece on the road, you should be able to, <laughs> you should be able to go around the, the corner and you should be able to hit that 50 pence piece on the road. If you'd say, well, I could probably be maybe a foot to the right or a foot to the left, you need to work on your steering because you need to be able to put that bike exactly where you want that bike to be. Okay. I'm no good running in the middle of the road and just hoping that I can keep it in the middle and I might run to the right and the left and hopefully I'll stay on the tarmac. You want to be able to run on that designated area that you have chosen. So we need to look at how to steer a bike properly and we'll look at the principles of counter steer and how it works and how different amounts of pressure applied in different ways and at different rates of pressure makes the bike change direction in a different way and how the speed of the motorcycle as the speed increases it gets harder to change direction so first thing is without going too deep on this video because this memory is just an overview one um, we're going to look at counter steer and how you make that bike change direction um, and that's important because if you come with tight twisty corners you need to, be able to change the direction quickly and get that bike to lean from left to right etc so looking at steering the bike through can't steer through the bars, but we're also going to look at how you steer the bike through the balls of the feet as well. It's got an input as well, and how that can aid your cornering, especially if you try, do track days and stuff, stuff like that. And how your body position is also going to aid the turning a lot. Sure, if you want to ride around about it, kind of what I call it, normal speeds on the road, then you can, you don't need to do all that stuff. And a lot of people say, do you need to hang off? Absolutely not. Um, some of the old classic riders never hung off at all. So you can sit in a fairly stationary position on a motorcycle, uh, just working it through the bars. You don't need to do anything really through the feet or through your body position. But if you get involved in track days and you start wanting to do some more performance riding, you will find that you become more animated on a motorcycle. You'll feel that you're weighting the pegs more, you're putting your knees into the tank more, steering the bike more with the inside of the knees as well, uh, and your body position and the bars. So it's all getting used together. But when you're doing what I call normal speeds, then all that kind of stuff isn't really necessary. So we're going to look at how you steer a bike, how you change direction. We'll do a wee video on that one. Um, next one we'll do, we'll look at um, how you use the the gears properly on a motorbike. Very important that you're in what we call the optimum gear. That's the gear that helps you to go, but it's also the gear that helps you to slow. If you're going at the corners with the gear too high and you close the throttle, the bike's going to want to run wide. If you open the throttle up, it feels flat as a pancake. But if the bike's in too low a gear when you close the throttle, it might engine brake too much. Uh, and if you touch the throttle, it might um, accelerate too quickly. So being in the right gear, the optimum gear, is going to give that right level of balance of torque and power so that you can control the bike through the, the corner control its weight distribution as well through the corner and it helps to steer the bike actually through the corner and we'll go into a bit more detail. So in other words, uh, using the gears, being in the right gear before you enter the bend and why that's so important. That takes more to the throttle, uh, correct use of the throttle, um, look at the way you downshift, look at the bike set up for the corner, being in the right gear before you enter, remember IBSGA, information, position, speed, being in the right gear before you enter the, the, the bend and why that's so important and we'll look at how you downshift through the gears and we'll look at the different methods from blipped at downshift to sustained throttle to close throttle downshift and which one's right for you all work it's just which one's working for you so getting the bike in the right gear get the bike set up before you get into the corner and get it all stable um, <coughs> The next one is the use of brakes. We're going to look at the use of brakes as well and why that's so important. Because on a motorbike, of course, you've got two brakes on a motorcycle, your front brake, the most efficient and most powerful brake, but the rear brake does a lot as well. And knowing how to use those brakes together and, and what combination and um, when would you use more of the front and when might you consider using more of the rear and when would you kind of balance them both 50-50 and when would you do trail braking? Ooh, that was never ever mentioned in the old test, was it? And yet, yeah, trail braking is a very, very effective and done correctly. Um, can actually be a lifesaver learning how to trail brake. Now, it's not something that I teach straight off. You've got to know what you're doing first of all before you even consider something like trail braking. But we'd look at things like trail braking as well. Why is those brakes so important? You know, I've seen people go into bends and they've thought they were too fast, terrified, petrified to lean, and the next thing, off they go. And if they just use their brakes and use them correctly, just a wee on the brakes, and that's it, the whole thing would have been under control. So, learn how to use the brakes properly. Um, once we've looked at the, the steering, and looked at your gearbox, and been in the right gears, and looked at how to using the brakes properly, combined with your clutch and downshifts, etc. 
next thing is understanding the tar grip trade-off and, and understanding what's determining how much grip's actually available under you. And this is obviously tied in with combination of the bike, your tires, the road surface that you're on, etc. But we'll look at that. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at um, the tire grip trade-off and, and what that actually means and how much grip's available. And when is it okay to brake hard? And when should you be easing off the brake? And when should you off the brakes completely? And is there any point when you should be off the throttle completely? And when is the point when you should be back on the throttle? And when's the point when you should start thinking about opening the throttle up? So that's all about timing. And that's also tied in with the limit point and the vanishing point, by the way. So again, we'll look at the use of the throttle as well, look at the gears, the whole lot. So in other words, to be able to control this bike, and I'm watching my video time here, to be able to control this motorcycle, the number of things that we've got to be able to do on the control then. We've got to be absolutely comfortable with throttle and the use of power. We've got to be absolutely comfortable with the clutch downshifting, smooth downshift. Yes, and a lot of the bikes have got slipper clutches these days, but uh, still, we need to have a bit of mechanical sympathy and understanding for what's going on, going on there. Um, understanding the gears and the effect of being in the, the optimum or the correct gear for the corners and using those brakes properly as well. And, as I say, learning how to make the bike lean, how to make it change direction and hit those points and flick through those bends. Especially when you've got a series of bends together, you want to be able to move um, from one point to another and change the direction. And be able to do that with confidence. Um, if you're going to bend, too fast and you just don't want to lean, you're going to run wide. It's as simple as that. So the limitation, I always say to somebody, you know, if somebody can only lean 15 degrees from the vertical, that's it. What's the maximum speed they can go around any corner? It's the speed that requires that amount lean. If they go around a bend that requires more lean than that, and it's a bit tighter, they're coming off. It's as simple as that. So you find that that type of ride that's really it's frightened to lean, they'll be reasonably okay around sort of gentle curving bends. It's when they get to the tight twist that suddenly looks like somebody just put the brakes on. That video that I uploaded the other day, for example, was a perfect example of that. Notice when they got in the straight, throttle was pulled open, giving it a bit of yee-haw. As soon as we came to the bend there, it was braking and all the rest of it. Now, I did say I was going to touch a little bit on that video as well that I uploaded. There was a number of things that that rider was doing wrong. You could see the rider wasn't very confident. The rider was going into the bend, was not positioning to open up the view. This made uh, limp, restricted the forward vision. Also made the bend a lot tighter. The bit where he goes past the cycler, the, the cyclist, and he tries to go up the inside of the cyclist. He makes the bend too tight. The cyclist, it's a right-hand bend. The cyclist is 